Good morning. Good morning. And good morning to those joining us online today. Let's get ready to worship Psalm 46, 1 through 3. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. If you're going through any troubles today, there's help. There's help for you and God today. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried in the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. In other words, no matter what's going on in our world around us, we will not fear, but we will draw strength from the Lord. Let's do that today. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Come on, give him a shout out today.
deeper. Go deeper. Go deeper. And in the deep places is abundant life. Ah. In the deep places of his spirit, he's moving.
when I hear the voice of my father. When I hear the voice of my father, he said, This is my child. And I hear the voice of my father, say, This is my child. And I hear the voice of my father.
lift your voice as it's singing again to him. We give you all. We
group here today. Yeah. Amen. I always, I always encourage new visitors, you know. I tell them, you know, we're loud, but we're safe. <laughs> you know. Um, today, as I was driving to church, for some reason, all these yield signs were standing out to me. And, you know, as a retired chaplain from the St. Cloud PD, I rode with the officers. And it got to a point where I realized that um, I, really, I really don't need a road. I just need room. You know, and, but when you're with an officer, they don't have to yield to anybody. But when you're on your own on the road, if you don't yield, you're in trouble. And, you know, that scripture that says, I walk by faith and not by sight? Well, I drive the same way. <laughs> I mean, I'm getting better, but I can slip into it in a New York minute, you know? But um, I, I was reading this scripture on yielding. And I think about the different things we, we yield to. It's not just the signs on the highway, but there are spiritual signs that we need to yield to. And the Holy Spirit that is within you will give you these signs. And if we yield the right of way to him, we're going to travel safe and we're going to be fulfilled and we're going to have joy, we're going to have peace. But if we don't yield and we take the right of way the wrong way, we're going to have trouble. It says, let me emphasize this. This is in Galatians 5. As you yield to the dynamic life and power of the Holy Spirit, you will abandon the cravings of your self-life. When your self-life craves the things that offend the Holy, the Holy Spirit, you hinder him from living free within you. Then it says, but when you yield to the life of the Spirit, you will no longer be living under the law, but soaring above it. Now, before you start throwing anything here, the behavior of the self-life is obvious. Sexual immorality, lustful thoughts, pornography, changing, chasing after things instead of God, manipulating others, hatred of those who get in your way, senseless arguments, resentments when others are favored, temper tantrums, angry quarrels, only thinking of yourself, being in love with your own opinions, and being envious of the blessings of others, murder, uncontrolled addictions, wild parties, and all similar behavior. Haven't I already warned you that those who use their, quote, freedom for these things will not inherit the kingdom of God? Ooh, I'm getting some looks. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. <laughs> But the fruit produced by the Holy Spirit within you is divine love, all its varied expressions, joy that overflows, peace that subdues, patience that endures, kindness in action, a life full of virtue, faith that prevails, gentleness of heart and strength of spirit. Never set the law above these qualities, for they are meant to be limitless. If the Spirit is the source of our life, we must also allow the Spirit to direct every aspect of our lives. So may we never be arrogant or look down on another, for each of us is an original. We must forsake all jealousy that diminishes the value of others. And you know, people, I, I think of these words, and I think of the fact that within each one of us are giftings. We each have giftings, and we, we are meant to fulfill each other, not to compete with each other. And so I encourage you today to dig down deep and ask God, God, what is my purpose in this church? What is my gifting? What is my fruit? How can I be used in a fuller capacity in my position as a member of this family at Jubilee Worship Center to bring glory and honor to God? I challenge you people today, I challenge you to dig deep into your heart and spend a minute with the Lord and say, God, show me. Give me an assignment. Put somebody in my path that, would, that I could do something and I could say something that will cause somebody else to look up and say, thank you, Jesus. Jonathan also sensed that he had a word today. Good morning. So the word says, you're my child, 
After you said yes, go and sin no more. I will equip you and help you for your calling. You may go through struggles, but let them grow you and mold you to who God created you to be. And do your best to find joy in struggles, even though it's hard. You gotta find that joy. That's what will get you through it. Your Lord Jesus is always there for you. All right, thank you for sharing. Why don't you greet some people around you? See that? everybody please be seated and welcome to Jubilee welcome those joining us online any who are here as guests today welcome to the Jubilee family we're so glad you're here there's a welcome card in front of you and we'd love to can you pull me down in the monitor please we'd love to get to know you better fill out that welcome card you can drop it in the offering basket or turn it into the kiosk Stop back there, we have a gift for you. If you wanna grab your bulletins, gonna cover a couple of things. Pastor Buddy, what is going on after church today and then a training you have two weeks from today? All right. Praise the Lord, saints. <laughs> Praise the Lord, saints. Y'all so quiet and y'all still sitting down. Praise the Lord, saints. Well, I think at least this side got it, Pastor Becky. I don't know about this side. They, they might be tired still. Hey, hey amen. Listen, guys, today we are having, first of all, y'all look so good. Can I just say that? Y'all look good. Give yourselves a round of applause. Y'all look good. Um, right after church today, we are doing a fundraiser for our youth where they can go to camp. We are, yay! So we are, selling, we are selling lunch plates, amen, not dinner plates. We're selling lunch plates so you can get a hamburger, a hot dog, some chips, and a drink for a donation of $7. Amen? Now, the key word is donation. If you want to give me 10, I ain't going to be mad. If you want to give me 20, I ain't going to be mad. If all you got is five, God bless you. Bring your five, amen? If all you got is a dollar, God bless you. Bring your dollar, Amen? It is a donation. What we're trying to do is subsidize some of the costs for the parents because right now it sits at about $300 per child. And so we're trying to help parents so they can get it. Now, on the other note, camp is almost due. So if your kid really wants to go, you need to come and see me because we only got about two or three weeks and then we have to have all camp fees due. All right, so we're doing this so that we can kind of help you guys a little bit. And for those that don't have kids, but you want to give a donation to our camp scholarship fund, on your offering card, just write in there for camp, 
scholarship, youth, whatever you want to write, we will gladly take that to add so we can help our parents. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, last but not least, on the 21st of May, I would like to meet with all ushers, anyone that works in the children's ministry, anyone that works in the youth ministry, and anyone that's in the nursery. I would like to meet with all of you immediately following service. We'll have a brief lunch, one, two, one, and two. then we're going to do a quick training. Amen? Amen. We're going to be rolling out something new in June, but I want to make sure all of you have it first. Amen? Amen. All right. That's my, all my announcements. Next week, I'll be back with video announcements. Amen. All right. Um, Pastor Becky, why don't you come up also? And uh, you've got a lot of inserts <laughs> today. But um, coming in, there's going to be a lot going on this summer. Coming in the first Tuesday night in June, we have a new class starting, uh, Four Keys to Hearing God's Voice. So we want you to be aware of that. Love to have you be a part of that. And then uh, the next talk and tea is this Tuesday, 6 to 7. Probably be one more, and then uh, those will not be going on through the summer. Mother's Day next Sunday. So come on out, Mom. It's going to be a great service. And then, Becky, why don't you share a couple things? Uh, and then I'll ask, before I hand the mic over to her, we're honoring graduates also the 21st. So if somebody in your household is graduating either from high school or college, and they'll be here that Sunday. Let us know on a welcome card or at the kiosk because we'd like to honor them. Okay, we are starting a new class, and it's going to start, it's this one, insert. It's going to start, it's going to be a four-week class on hearing the voice of God and prophesying. Do you know you can prophesy? Yes. So um, it'll be Wednesday nights, and you'll see the dates there. And it will be from 7 to 8 o'clock here in the sanctuary. And then our backyard bonfires are back. Yeah. <laughs> if you've never come to those, we have a great time. It is the first Wednesday of each month, and uh, Mark and I live next door. Two driveways over and we open up our home our backyard it's you just bring dish to share we have all the broads hot dogs buns ketchup bonfire s'mores beverages paperware all that and we just hang out and have a great time and you'll get to know your church family better and just hang out with them so that starts soon kids kids dismissed this? no this Oh, <laughs> okay, and for the kids, I am doing a special Wednesday night right after Mother's Day, so it'll be a week from this Wednesday night. We are going to have an exploring night, and I'm going to take them all outside, and we're going to explore the church land, so that should be fun, don't you think? If you want to help me, please do. I'm going to be like... How am I going to keep track of all these little kids? Okay. We're going to have fun, though. All right. Are we on here? Check. We've been having some troubles with this. Uh, there we go. Okay. Ushers, come kids. You may be dismissed for Kids Church. So kids, welcome to go. And I'll just read as we're getting ready to receive the offering from Luke 16.10. Jesus said this, he who is faithful in what is least is also faithful in much, and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. That's really an important principle because here's what happens sometimes. We get this idea that I don't have enough to be faithful with. And our idea is, well, if I had more, I'd be more faithful. But actually the truth is, Getting more doesn't make you more faithful. So as we're faithful in whatever we've been entrusted, it's then God gives us more. So be faithful with whatever God has given you, and he will entrust more to you. And, of course, a part of that faithfulness is your giving. So you can go ahead, ushers, receive the offering. And we're going to jump into the message today. If you want to follow along with me, you can turn to... Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4. Last Sunday, uh, we began looking at what a growing 
mature people of God look like from Ephesians 4, verses 12 to 16. And I want to emphasize that we're talking about what a mature people of God look like, not just each individual, but also what we look like together. And from that passage, we looked at nine different characteristics. I'm going to review those very quickly. We saw that the saints are equipped for the work of the ministry. And by the way, remember, saints don't mean like super Christians that few can attain to. The word saints in the Bible is simply a believer who's living a holy life. We're all called to be saints. And then number two, the body is built up and therefore strong. Number three, the body of Christ is walking in the unity of the faith. Number four, the body of Christ is walking in the unity of the knowledge of the Son of God. And this all brings us to a maturity as measured by manifesting more of the fullness of Christ. And as we mature, we become more stable and we aren't easily deceived by false teaching or by deceiving people. And then number six, the body of Christ speaks the truth in love. Number seven, the body of Christ grows up into Christ, the head of the church. And number eight, and this kind of goes along with the word Pat shared, that every member of the body of Christ is fulfilling their God-given function in the body while working in a healthy way as a team and connected in a relational and functional way to the body. Let me just explain that. To be connected functionally means that we're using our God-given calling to serve one another. And to be connected relationally means we are doing that in a healthy way relationally to one another. You can have amazing relationships but not be using your gifts, or you could be using your gifts but doing it in an unrelational way. So we need to learn to be connected relationally and functionally, and then finally the results of that is the body of Christ grows in maturity and builds itself up in love, and then finally that leads us to Ephesians 5.27 which says that he, which is Jesus, might present her, which is the church, to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. That's the church Jesus is coming for. So that's where we want to be headed, to be that church radiating the glory of God, walking pure before God impacting our culture. Now, that brings us the question, how do we get there? How do we live out all of that that we just read? Well, we started with verse 12, so if we go back to verse 11, it really gives us the answer. It says, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Why? And then we begin our, where we started, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So, I call these five gifts to the church, five functional gifts, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Notice their purpose is to equip the saints for ministry and to bring the saints to maturity. Now, there have been a lot of abuses and excesses with some of these gifts, and hopefully we can address some of those as we continue in this series. Some have seen these gifts as like status symbols, as though those who have those callings, they're up here, and everybody who doesn't have those callings, they're down here, sort of putting them on a pedestal, sort of like, well, they do all of the real ministry and the rest of us just cheer them on from the sidelines or the rest of us just give and serve them so they can fulfill their powerful calling. But what I want you to recognize is that really about the opposite of that is the truth. You'll notice after verse 11, these gifts aren't even mentioned because they're not the focus. The focus is what they produce in everybody else. 
These gifts do not exist to be served by the saints, but they exist to serve the saints. I use this analogy when I watch an NFL football game. I'm not focused on the coaches on the sideline. I'm focused on the players on the field. These five functional gifts, they are not the players on the field while the rest of us are in the stands cheering them on or being entertained by them. These functional gifts are the coaches on the sidelines, and it's the rest of the body of Christ that are out there on the field. Amen. Now, I gave a couple of examples that these gifts, if they exist, as the Scripture says, to bring us to full maturity and equip us fully for ministry, then I want you to see these gifts as like five spiritual food groups. To be as healthy as we can be, we need a proper balance of the five food groups, the five spiritual food groups. If we leave any out or if, if it's unbalanced, the bottom line is we're just not going to be spiritually as healthy as we can be. I gave another illustration. Think of the church as having an engine, a five-cylinder engine, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. And if that church is going to be powerful, efficient, and accomplish its purposes, it has to be firing on all five cylinders. If any of the cylinders aren't functioning, the church might still move, but not powerfully not efficiently, it will not accomplish what God has for it to accomplish. And I want to uh, ask you this question, could it be, because a lot of the church world today is functioning on three of the five cylinders. We got a pastor, evangelist, teacher, those are functioning fairly well in the body of Christ, but often the cylinders the functional gifts of apostle and prophet are like, do they still exist? Or what are they? Or, or it goes the other way. And again, they're way up here and everybody else is way down there. But could it be that because the church today, for the most part, has not figured out how to be firing in a balanced way on all five cylinders, could it be that's why the church today is not having the same level of impact on its culture that the early church did in the New Testament? Now, we want to look at some questions that we'll address in this series. I won't get to all of them today, but what are each of these five functional gifts? How do they relate to each other? How do they relate to the church? And how should each believer or each member of the body of Christ relate or be impacted by each of these five gifts? Those are some of the questions we're going to address in this series. And I'll just tell you here that I'm not going to get very far in the notes today. I just felt that I'm to really kind of slow down. Just the, the message came today and has been coming deep, calls to deep, go deeper. So we're going to go a little bit deeper into some of these passages instead of skim over them. So uh, you have a handout that looks like this. I may or may not get to that. If not, we'll give those out again next week, but we're going to see that the church is built on an apostolic and prophetic foundation. We're not going to define that today, but I do want to establish that. And by the way, um, Mother's Day next Sunday, I'm not going to continue this series next Sunday. I feel like God's given me uh, a whole different message that I'm really looking forward to for next Sunday. Do um, you want the title of it? Mama Bears, it's time to roar. That's, that's next Sunday. So, so we'll, we'll set this aside and then pick it up the Sunday after that. Please be praying for me with that message. So if you're in Ephesians 4, go back to Ephesians 2. Back to Ephesians 2, verse 19. Now, therefore, you... You are no longer strangers and foreigners, 
but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So the body of Christ in, in this verse is being compared to a building. Now, you all know the church isn't a building, right? Like when you drive by and, and you say, oh, that's a nice church. How do you know? That's just the building the church meets in. The church isn't the building. The church is the people, okay? Yeah. But, but uh, Paul is using an analogy of the church, comparing it to a, a physical structure, but he's telling us how the church is a spiritual structure. So in this spiritual structure called the household of God, you are all called to be members of that spiritual structure. Now, we're going to come back to Ephesians 2 in a moment, but I want to go to 1 Peter 2 because it fits so well here. 1 Peter 2, 5. Okay, so we have this spiritual structure. You're a member of it. Here's, here's your role. 1 Peter 2, 5. You, that's you, you also are living stones. Living stones. So every one of you in the household of God, the spiritual structure of the household of God, every one of you are living stones in that structure being built up now that phrase being built up just kind of put that on the back burner we'll, we're going to come back to that but i i want you to be aware of it being built up a here it is a spiritual house a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to god through jesus christ just as all of you are called to be saints all of you are also called to be a part of a holy royal priesthood. You are all called to be priests. Well, what do priests do? Let me, let me mention three things that priests do. One of the things priests do is they represent God to people. So as you, as you share your faith with others, you are representing God to people. As you minister to others... Remember from previous messages, you are an ambassador of Christ. Yes. You, are, you are a kingdom operative. Yes. You are a minister of reconciliation, and a part of your calling is reconciling people to God. So in that role, you are, you are exercising your priesthood. But there's a second duty of a priest. That's sort of the reverse and that is as a priest, you represent people to God. How do you do that? By praying on behalf of others, by ministering uh, to others and, and bringing others to God in intercession. So as a priest of God, as a part of this priesthood, you represent God to people, you represent people to God. And a third function of the priest is to offer continual sacrifices in the temple. Now, under the New Testament, what does that mean? That means the sacrifices we offer continually would be the sacrifice of praise, of praise. If you want to write down this verse, it's not in your notes, Hebrews 13, 15. Hebrews 13, 15 says, Therefore by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise. We don't offer animals anymore, but the sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. All right, so in this household of the Lord, you're, you are living stones. You are called to be a part of this priesthood. Now, that in mind, let's go back to Ephesians 2. And let's look at the next verse, which is verse 20. Having been built on the foundation of apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So the, the, the structure of God's spiritual house is the foundation is apostolic and prophetic with Jesus being the chief cornerstone. Now, I'm not going to, in this message, get into explaining what an apostolic and prophetic foundation means, but let me just um, say this. As you know, the foundation of a structure is vital. The rest, of the, found the rest of the building has to be held up by that foundation. So the foundation has to be adequate for the extent of the structure going on it. 
Can you imagine building a foundation thinking, I'm going to build a 2,000 square foot house. The foundation gets done and then you decide, well, I changed my mind. I'm going to put a skyscraper on that foundation. Not going to work, right? Well, here's the thing. If the church does not have the right foundation, it cannot support the magnitude of the work that God wants to do. And one of, one of the problems I believe we have in the church world today is much of the church world is not built on the right foundation, so it cannot, it cannot handle the magnitude of what God would really like to do. The right foundation is not a pastoral foundation. It's an apostolic and prophetic foundation. Again, we'll get into that. But I want you to notice that the real key here is the cornerstone. What does the cornerstone do? The cornerstone ties the building together. It ties the foundation together. The cornerstone is the focus of the foundation. Jesus Christ must be the foundation of the church. Jesus Christ must be the focus of the church. He is the cornerstone. He is the head, the head of his church. I am not the head of Jubilee. Jesus is the head. I'm just one of his under shepherds. He is the head. He must be the controlling uh, unit of the rest of the church. Now, let's go to verses 21 and 22, and here's where we're going to really slow down. In whom the whole building being joined together. Say together with me. Together. Together. Guess what can't happen? Together. Without together. You can't be together by not being together, right? You see, in the church, we're, we're so focused on us, my relationship with God, what I can get out of it. And there's a place for that. But what we'll notice here today, there's a lot of togethers. So the only way we can fulfill a together is together, right? We can't fill it together if we're disconnected, if we're not a part of the together. Now, being joined together, another word for joined, the Greek word could also be translated fitted, fitted. And we're going to talk about being fitted together. And actually, In the King James, it says, fitly framed together. Fitly framed together. And back to verse, chapter 4, verse 16, from whom the whole body joined and knit together. And there the King James is fitly joined together. I want to look at that phrase being fitted together. Growing up, my, my dad, in his spare time, would, like, build a house for us to move into. So before I was born, he built a house. And then when I was born and came home from the hospital, we were already in that house for a little while. So that house sort of born in. And then what he would do is he would buy a piece of land in his spare time, build a house on it while doing his full-time job. And then when the house was finished, you know, six months, a year later, but then we'd move. And then you know what he'd do? He'd start the same process again. So in his spare time, he built four houses. Now, the last one was my senior year. And that was the only house he decided to put a fireplace in. And so he had this fireplace that was going to be open from two sides, two separate rooms. One of the sides was all brick. But the other side was stones. Remember the phrase, living stones. Keep that in mind, and being fitted. So my dad had this pile of stones and this wall, fireplace, that these stones were going to go on. Now, these stones were flat, but they were all different shapes, sizes, and different colors or different tints or shades. So... What my dad would do is he would look at the, you know, the place for the next stone, and then he would look at the pile, and he would pick one that was sort of shaped like he envisioned for that spot. And then he had this, I don't know what you call it, a block hammer maybe? It's like instead of the two claws of a hammer, it's like one long one. And he would take the stone, and if it had like a something protruding that wouldn't allow it to fit in the place he envisioned for it, he would take the back of that hammer and 
break it off. And occasionally a few sparks flew. Not all that many pieces were he, was he able to just fit them without first fitting them. By the time that fireplace was done, it was beautiful. And when you looked at it, it had all these different shapes, all these different sizes, all these different shades, yet it was one united wall. Those were dead stones, but some of you are starting to get the picture. In order for you and I to fulfill our calling from God, in order for you and I to be fully equipped for ministry, fully brought to maturity, I know you're not going to like this, but we have to go through a fitting yes. process. A fitting process. I don't know that there's any of us who the moment we get saved, we're already fitted. Now, we like to think we are. We would like to think, well, we're not the ones who should be fitted. Everybody else should be fitted around me. I shouldn't have to change. Everybody else should have to change. Don't mess with me. I'm good. So what happens as you and I grow and begin to mature is God starts taking us through a fitting process. Let me tell you what people do, several scenarios. And as I share these, you might see yourself in one of these, but probably you're just going to see other people you know. Okay. <laughs> so some of the people, when, the fitting, when they began going through the fitting process, and by the way, the fitting process is uncomfortable. At times, painful. Sometimes sparks fly. There's a scripture in Proverbs, iron sharpens iron. So some people, unfortunately, it's a small minority. Some people yield to the process. They let God knock off the rough edges, and they get properly fitted, joined. Unfortunately, again, small percentage. Then there's another group of people, and as God is taking them through the fitting process, they run from the process. They just leave the church. They go find another church. But if they're there very long, God's like, we didn't finish the process yet. We're going to go through this again. And now they either decide, well, okay, this time I get it. I'm going to yield. Or they just run again. Or another scenario is as people begin going through this fitting process, they're like, I don't like this, this hurts, this doesn't feel good, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to another church, but I'm not going to get close enough to have my rough edges dealt with. And often that means a big church, because it's easier to hide in a big church, and you just sort of stay, you know, on the outskirts, and, you know, you just enjoy all the stuff going on, but you're not really connected relationally or functionally so your stuff doesn't really get dealt with, but neither are you fulfilling your calling. Or here's another scenario, a very unfortunate one. Some people just decide, I'm done with the church. I'm just forgetting the church. This is too difficult. Now, a lot of times, they don't give up their faith in God. Fortunately, some do, but uh, fortunately, many of these, they don't give up their faith in God. They just don't want anything to do with his church. And here's what happens. They just simply stay stuck, stay immature. They are not fully equipped for ministry. They are not fully mature because that's impossible alone. Right. We got to be fitted together. Yeah. Let's keep reading verse 20. Fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. So what's God doing? He's trying to get us to where we can be a holy temple. Now, don't think temple building. Think of temple, a place where God and his people meet. Doesn't have to be a building. It could be a building. But wherever God and the people meet together, that's a holy temple. So God's got some work to get us to that place. Now, let's go to the next verse, verse 22. In whom you also... Also, this is different than what we just read, in whom you also are being built together. Being joined together, 
or fitted together, being built together. They're two different things. Two different things. Remember, we just read 1 Peter 2, 5. You also are living stones, are being built up, a spiritual house. Here's the thing. You and I like, we like the being built together part. Because built together means encouraged. It means strengthened. It means edified. It's all the good stuff. Here's the problem. You're not going to be built together until you are first fitted together. We're like, God, just just build us together. And God's like, no, that's not the order. You got to get the foundation right first. We got to get you fitted together. And if I can just get you fitted together, oh, what I could do, what I could do, building you together. Well, then what what does it finally look like? Let's keep reading. Built together. By the way, The Greek word there actually means Lego. I was shocked when I looked that up. Lego. Any any of you with kids or grandkids, do they just play with one Lego and that's good? No, the whole focus of Legos is joining them together, fitting them together. They've got to fit together. We are living stones. We are Legos in the body of Christ. Then it says, for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. The King James uses the word habitation. And one of the songs we sang fit this theme. Sometimes in the church world, we, we talk or pray, oh, we just need a visitation from God, visitation from God. I probably said it, I probably prayed it, but stop and think about it. What is the root word of visitation? Visit. Visit is not permanent. If you had visitors for Easter, they eventually left, right? You hope they eventually left, right? <laughs> Yeah, but some of you visited, and they wanted you to eventually leave too, right? So, and as a visitor, you're not, you're not like in charge of that house, right? I mean, if you have a visitor over, it's your house. You got, it's your rules, right? And if you're visiting somebody else, then they're the host. It's their house. Well, the problem with a visitation is it makes God the visitor, which means he's going to leave before long, and it also means it must not really be his house if he's the visitor. You're not a visitor in your own house. So let me uh, say this this way. God has no interest in being a visitor in his church. He wants to come and take over because it's his house. He's the head. He's the cornerstone. He doesn't want visitation. He wants habitation. How do we get there? By being fitted together, by being joined together, by being built together, by becoming a part of that holy priesthood, by taking our place as living stones in the place God chooses for us. Now, that would bring the question, how does God fit us? What's the process he takes us through? Well, I'll just say this. He'll use whatever it takes. The more resistant you are, the more dramatic the fitting. The more you yield, the e- it's never easy. It's never pain-free, but the more you resist, the harder it is. The more difficult. So, what he uses is apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. He uses those gifts to help fit us. But he also uses something called the Word of God, the Bible. He also uses the Holy Spirit. Now, those are his preferred tools, all of those. If we're resistant to those tools, then you know who he often uses? People you don't care for a whole lot. He'll use those people. (laughs) And he may use, like, yucky circumstances. 
Again, he'll use whatever it takes. He's very patient. Now, Ephesians 5.27, which we read earlier, once all this is functioning, then we become the church he's ready to come for. That church radiating the glory of God, that vibrant church, holy, fruitful. I'm going to just real quickly, and we'll just pick this up again two weeks from today, but I want to look through this chart real quickly. That would be your hand out here. I'm going to do this real, real quick, and then we'll close. I call this the five functional gift chart, and you'll notice we have all these columns, and this is just to help us get a, a rough idea. Again, we'll come back to it, a rough idea of what these gifts are. And so, first of all, we're going to cover teacher. So we're covering these in reverse order. And we're going to use a finger on the hand to represent each of these gifts so it's easy to remember. And we can see that the hand, that these functional gifts are the hand of God to his church. And so we're going to use for the teacher the pinky, the smallest. Why the pinky? Because the smallest finger can get deepest into your ear. <laughs> and the teacher wants to get the Word of God deep into your ear. I'm going to use a functional word starting with the letter G again to make it easy to remember. The teacher's function is to ground the saints in the Word of God. Their focus then, of course, is teaching the Word of God a strength that I'm talking now if a church is led by that particular gift, a common strength of that church, as well as a common weakness that not every gift will have that exact weakness, but they're common. And also can be common weaknesses if a church is led by that particular gift and, and they haven't figured out how to compensate for it. And I'll just say this, we'll get to it another week, but any one of these five functional gifts can effectively lead a local church. Now that may be a new concept, so just put that on the back burner. But a strength of a church that's led by a teacher is that the people will know the Word of God. And if that teacher is doing his or her job of equipping the saints, then the saints are taught how to read, how to study the Word of God, how to feed yourself so you know the Word of God. Now, a common weakness, not true of every teacher, but often teachers aren't like all that strong in evangelism. They're, they're better at taking the saints and growing them than they are evangelizing. And then a weakness I call spirit light, which would not be true of every teacher, but often teachers are so cognitive in their gifting that often they're just not all that good at being spontaneously led by the Holy Spirit. Now, again, they could grow in that. That could be a secondary gift, uh, but often that's not the strength of teachers. Then we go to the pastor. The pastor is the next finger, the ring finger, because the pastor should have the heart of the bridegroom for the bride. The G function is guards. Uh, another word in scripture for pastors is shepherds. So you think of the shepherd as, as watching, guarding, protecting the sheep. And, and, and pastors, that's, that's a part of their function is to try to protect, keep the, the sheep safe. Their focus is caring and nurturing. So the shepherd not only protects, but feeds, nurtures, makes sure the sheep are doing well. And so the strength of a church led by a pastor is typically the saints will have their basic needs met, and they're going to feel cared for, loved on. And if the, if the pastor has equipped the saints for ministry, then the saints also have learned how to nurture care for one another. Weaknesses, I have the word inclusive there, and what I, what I mean by that I'm too far ahead here. Let's see. Sorry about that. There we go. What I mean by inclusive is often the pastoral gift is, is focused almost exclusively on those inside the walls of the church. In other words, the focus isn't how do we disciple the nations? How do we transform our community? It's, it's how do we care for all of those within the walls? And then we have the evangelist. If you put all your fingers together, the middle one sticks out the furthest. It reaches out the furthest. So that, that represents the evangelist whose function is outreach. So uh, their G function is to gather in the harvest of lost souls. 
Their focus then is saving souls. A strength of a church led by an evangelist is lots of souls will typically get saved through the ministry of that church. And if the evangelist is equipping the saints for ministry, then the saints tend to also know how to share their faith and win people to Jesus. And a church led by an evangelist, one of the uh, weaknesses typically is the saints aren't well fed because every sermon somehow ends up in evangelism. Now, as I'm going through this, some of you are thinking of some of the churches you've been a part of, and you're like, oh, that's why that church was that way. The differences between churches is often more about the gift leading the church than the denomination they're connected with. And then we have the prophet. The prophet is the index finger because the prophet is pointing out what God is saying to the church. And they guide, that's the G word, but they guide with the word of the Lord. They guide with the prophetic word of the Lord. So their focus is declaring what God is saying to the church, what saith the Lord. The strength typically of a church led by a prophet is the people, if they've been equipped, they know how to hear God pretty well. And usually they're a praising church. There is often a connection between prophetic and praise. Remember the kings in the Old Testament when they wanted to hear from God, often they brought a minstrel in because it, it you know, kind of woke up their spiritual ears. And then um, also a, a prophetic church is usually strong in moving in the gifts of the Spirit because that's a part of the prophetic gifting. One of the weaknesses, sometimes prophetic can be very direct, black and white, and sooner or later that means probably somebody will feel offended and feel like, well, you're too hard on me. So that's a part of those dynamics. And then finally, we have, and we'll end with this, the apostle. And notice in your hand, the thumb is the most different of the others. The apostolic is more different in some ways than these others. Notice also your thumb is the only one that can most easily touch all the others. Because the apostle often it sort of is like a pastor to the other five, other four functions. Notice also if you make a fist, the thumb covers the other fingers. Often the apostolic is like a spiritual covering to the other gifts. That's as far as I'm going to get, but I'll just mention this. All of these weaknesses can be overcome in a couple of ways. They can be overcome by whatever their secondary gifting is. They can, be, they can be overcome simply by their growing, whatever was a weakness, learning to make that strong. Or, or they can overcome by bringing others who have gifts where they don't. Now, that might be other pastors on staff have these other gifts. It might be others with these gifts are brought in from time to time to cycle through and impart to the church. It might be, I don't like the term lay people, but it might be some of the people within the church have these gifts and that, that they are exercising their gifts where the leadership may not have those particular gifts. So I'm going to just stop right there. So much more we could go, but this would be a good stop point. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. And as we close, I just want to summarize, God wants his church to be fully equipped for ministry, fully brought to maturity. He wants us to be that glorious church without spot or wrinkle washed in the blood of the lamb to get there. We've got to go through the fitting process. But if we go through the fitting process, if we get properly fitted, then he can build us together. We can function as that holy, royal priesthood. And we can be that habitation of God's presence through his Holy Spirit. Now, that habitation may happen when we gather together and worship, but it can happen wherever saints are gathered. They can be a place of God's habitation. Do you think if we are a people of habitation, we just might be more effective at reaching a world 
that is hungry for that. They just don't know it. I'm going to close in prayer, and as I do, uh, those who are serving as prayer teams today, you can make your way to the front. And after I close, you are welcome to uh, be dismissed. Remember, if you're able to stay, even if you want to bring food with you, you can. And if anybody here today, you're like, I, I don't know if I'm right with God. I don't, I don't know if I'm, you know, one of the sheep. I don't know if I'm a part of the body of Christ. I don't know. Maybe I need to give my life, get my life right with God. If you're in that place, why don't you come and let one of the prayer teams know, and they would just love to pray with you and encourage you in your spiritual journey. Let's pray. Father, what an amazing destiny you have for us together, together. I pray that we will catch this vision of what you've called your church to be, and we realize this is what our world needs to see today. Lord, could we be that? Could we be that? Lord, as we talked about the fitting process, perhaps we all did a little bit of self-reflection. Maybe a light came on like, oh, that's what I was going through. Lord, would you give us the grace, the mercy, the empowerment to yield to that fitting process? Lord, refine us. Lord, any edges, rough edges that would not enable us to be properly fitted. Lord, would you remove those and help us to be yielded to that process? Lord, I pray that your church today, Jubilee and globally, your church would be that holy temple, that place of habitation. And Lord, may the saints recognize their high calling as a part of a royal, holy priesthood. And Lord, I pray that each one would recognize they are living stones in this spiritual household of God. And they have a valuable place where once they're fitted together, and built up together, they are an integral part of the household of God. Help each one discover that place and walk that out. And so I just pray that over our church family. And over all of your church, oh God, let your church all over the world rise up and be, and be this glorious church ready for your return. And until you come, may we be doing your work in our world. And I ask all of this in Jesus' name and pray that truly we would be a habitation for your presence by the Holy Spirit. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So, living stones, you're welcome to be dismissed. Come for prayer. Grab a bite to eat on your way out. God bless you.